Okay, so by way of general introduction, um, I guess today is where we want to contextualize some of the stuff that we'll be talking about uh, later on by asking or starting with the question, first of all, what is an equality? Um, it's a word I'm sure you've probably heard many times already throughout the degree, but we want to put a more finer definition on it. The second question we want to ask is, uh, is it really as bad as we think? Uh, if you keep up with popular media, um, or you have done over the last three or four years, you've probably have noticed that the term inequality, particularly income inequality, has received quite a lot of attention. Um, there's no reason for this. Um, if anyone was following about a year or two ago, um, I'll put a link to the study and perhaps we'll talk we'll be talking about it in subsequent weeks. Um, under the Equality Act in Great Britain, uh, for the first time, companies were required to report uh, the gender balance within their firms, but also the gender disparity in terms of earnings. So for the very first time, it's kind of unique amongst Western European countries, we had a full list of just within the UK of all the companies uh, and the percentage or the share of the, the share of wages essentially accruing to women versus that accruing to men. Uh, and on that basis, we were able to isolate the best firms and the worst firms. Um, and I must have a guess actually for the worst formulas. Where do you think, as a woman, female, with a seal binaries for the moment in the Portuguese and women that would where do you think would be one of the worst places to work? If you can think of the worst organization to work for in terms of earnings and starting. Yeah. Restaurants, like um bar and um Yeah, restaurants are pretty bad. There's an important reason for this, of course, which is that, again, if we look at the breakdown of employment, women tend to work more part-time than men. And again, the earnings effect that we see within those sectors is also partly to do with part-time employment, but it's also due to the systemic fact that women are also ignored in those sectors as well. But it wasn't restaurants, surprisingly. It wasn't even weather stuff. We could go back and forth, though. We won't get one more guess at me. Sorry? Thanks. There were a couple of banks, but the worst one actually was Ryanair. Um, we'll be coming back to Ryanair later on. It's an interesting teaching example. But it gives us sort of a sense of some of the mechanisms at work when we think about but what leads to earnings and equality. If we look at the structure of Ryanair, it's a large firm, certainly. It's got a certain layer of management. It's also got pilots, and it's also got quite a substantial number of cabin crew. In the main, those cabin crew tend to be female, and the majority of pilots tend to be male. So that earnings disparity is coming from the fact that, first of all, within that profession, within the pilot's profession, there's already a standard uh, gender inequality. When we take that in terms of the organisation as a whole, and we put high pilot earnings next to low cabin crew earnings, we emerge with a figure that shows us that in this industry, at least, women are amongst the worst, the worst paid. Incidentally, one of the best, uh, it turns out, is Primark, they know uh, pennies, you know, pennies. Um, and again, the reasons for that sort of run kind of the other way, but the majority of floor staff being female, but also they're quite heavily unionized, surprisingly. I'm always conflicted about whether or not to shop in there, because on the one hand you've got, you know, the way the stuff is produced, then bizarrely their management is done slightly pro-union for most of the system, so it's kind of a, it's kind of a conundrum. But anyway, we'll talk about that later. This is what the world looks like today. I'm going to take it from the 1980s to about 2015. And I think it would be just enough for us to stop and say the line is going up, therefore something needs to happen, and then something might be bad. But we want to take a closer look at this and see what's going on. What you're looking at here is the share of national income as a percentage accruing to the top 10% of earners. What this means is if we took within any given society, so for each of these lines we've got a separate country, if we were to take a survey or a census of everybody's earnings in that country, which is essentially what this has done. In not exactly what we'll into that in later weeks. If we were to add up everything that everybody earns in the country of India, in the US, Canada, in Russia, in China, Europe, and so on, and if we were to separate out just the highest earners, the highest 10%, if we were to line those people up in order and stop all the way up, we get to 90% of the population, and we're just left with the, with the highest 10%, the highest earning individuals in that society. And we ask, what percentage of the total income accrues to those individuals? That's what this figure here is showing us. And it's an interesting prospect because in a completely, think about this, in a fictional, in an ideal, perfectly equal society, um, none of which no contemporary examples exist, so we'll talk about some models. Um, this does not occur anywhere in the natural observable world. But in a perfectly equal society, there would be no difference. If everybody earned exactly the same, there would be no rank, and the top 10% would get 10% of the income, and 
the bottom 10%, you get 10% of the total income, and so on and so on. So if we just take this as it is, we see that for India, the top 10% account for almost half of the total income in India. So what this is telling us is that that sort of that small minority of 10% of the population, the wealthiest 10% of the population, they take almost or just over half of the total income within that country. And this is one of the principal ways in which we start to rank countries on their respective levels of inequality. The idea here being that in a society where income is relatively equally distributed, then we would see this figure becoming much lower, which we do down here. If we aggregate up the European countries, this figure is slightly lower. What's interesting also is the rate of change. If we take a country like China, we see China has undergone pretty rapid economic, and economic development and industrialization. And we see that the rate of inequality has increased here substantially, as it has in Russia after the fall of communism and after the collapse of the Berlin Wall and the Cold War and so on. We see Russian inequality increasing as well, quite strongly. That's all well and good, but what's happening to the poorest individuals? If we just take Europe, so if we isolate out Europe, we see that what's happened to the bottom 50%, so these are the laborers of that country, if you like, versus the top 1%, their fortunes have fallen also almost in parallel with the rise of the top 1%. So this, in a sense, is a dual story, one of the parallel sort of rising fortunes of the wealthy and sort of stagnating or in some cases decreasing fortunes for individuals on the other end of the income distribution. That's all well and good, but where is this going? Maybe this is just an artifact of the financial crisis. We had a pretty big recession, which began in 2008 with the collapse of the global financial system. So maybe this is just a temporary blip. Maybe the world is readjusting and will resume this trajectory of falling inequality in a couple of years. Our best projections assume, and again, this report is linked online if you want to take a look at this in your own plan. Our best projections assume that if things continue as they are, the structure of our societies continues as it is, if our economic activity continues as it is, if our employment laws and regulations and income growth continues as it is. We're looking at a situation where by 2050, we're at a level of very top income inequality, which is increasing almost uninterrupted, whilst the fortunes are like the share of the global middle class, it's the middle 40% of earners, those people sort of sitting right there in the middle of the distribution, middle income earners, is going to remain either static or fall, almost at a rate comparable to that of growth, of growth and wealth. So the story is, unfortunately, the picture of global inequality seems to be one where we're heading towards a business as usual situation, whereby in 10 to 20 years, we're going to be in a scenario where we have unprecedented levels of inequality. Already we're at a point, just after the great financial crisis, we reached a point where we had seen levels of inequality not seen since 1928, since the Great Depression in the United States. We've already surpassed that, so the world is now at a place where, as long as records have begun, we can't really wind back that far, as we see countries that keep very good income data for a very, very long time, really until the mid-20th century. But as far back as we can measure, as best we know, the world, the capitalist world at least, has never been as unequal as it is today and things are set to get much worse. That's all well and good, you might say. And the quality doesn't really matter because we're doing things like reducing poverty. If all economies are growing at the same rate, then surely more individuals are becoming employed as countries industrialize, maybe they're developing social welfare programs, unemployment benefit coverage. Maybe real earnings are growing in these countries and individuals who were once in dire or absolute poverty are now being lifted out of that. And that was certainly true for part of the 20th century, for much of the 20th century. But if we look at what's happened here, we'll not go too much into this calculation, but basically what this is, it's, it's a standardized series of wages. And what this shows us, essentially what these lines are telling us, is the rate or the level or the extent of wage growth in G20 emerging nations, G20 advanced, and the total G20. So for advanced nations, it appears as if income has stagnated. Real wages have stagnated. There has been essentially, if we factor in inflation, there has been little to no real wage growth in the G20 advanced economies for the last 20 years. So if we look at just wages, wages have gone up. We've passed laws for things like minimum wages, companies have implemented within industry 
wage compacts and of wage workers' wages, but inflation is also part of that, debt is also part of that. So when we adjust for that, real wages appear almost, almost to be flat. That's all well and good, you might say, but is that really a problem when things are equally distributed? One index we can look at is the gender equality index, the gender pay gap using early wages. So what you're looking at here is, this is essentially the percentage below which, the percentage of male wages below which women's earnings fall. So if we take here the high income average, 16.2, what this is telling us is that if we add up all of the high income countries in this list, in total women's earnings are about 16.2% those of men's, all across those countries. So we're sort of moving on a bit and saying, well, yeah, we've got high inequality, we've got stagnant wage growth, but is that really such a problem if within countries we're addressing inequalities like inter-ethnic inequalities or gender inequalities? Are women's earnings catching up to those of men? Real earnings are catching up. And certainly there has been improvement in the Irish, if you're looking for Ireland, it's just sitting around here, just on 14%, just slightly above the high income average. Those countries here, Argentina and Panama, are ones where women's earnings exceed those of males. You can see the negative figures in Argentina and Panama. Women's earnings are about 2.9% above those of males. But almost universally in every other high income country. Here we see Korea the worst at 32%. That gender pay gap still remains. So that's all well and good, but surely we're still reducing poverty. If you're reading the news last week, you might have seen uh, that Oxfam published a report that was looking, they publish this report pretty much every year. Uh, it's sort of a global wealth survey where they look at the state of global inequality and they ask questions like, well, how good is the world doing in terms of alleviating absolute poverty in terms of generating, um, in terms of generating equality on an international or cross-national basis? So I mentioned, uh, I think on Monday, one of the phenomena that we've seen in the last 10 years since the Great Recession is that the fortunes of dollar billionaires uh, across the world has doubled almost over that time period, just within that 10 year time frame. If we look into this report, it's actually showing us that, contrary to some of over the noble millennium development goals or ethos of that time, certainly, is that absolute poverty is increasing once again. The number and absolute poverty is slightly different to other poverty measures. Absolute poverty means any individual anywhere earning less than or subsisting on sorry less than 550 a day standardized in US dollars. So we count the number of individuals to whom that applies as best we can. Again, there are serious data issues with this. That figure is increasing. So when we talk about absolute poverty, we take an absolute figure. The absolute figure here is $5.50. The number of individuals below that is the number or the proportion of individuals in absolute poverty. There's a few other things as well. If we look at the breakdown of who actually composes or who comprises individuals in the top earning category, we see that the majority of those, almost 50% more, are men than women. In fact, if we just look at the Fortune 500 list, so you probably see these wealth lists published every now and then. The top 10 in the US is particularly interesting because you've got people like, well, Jeff Bezos is an obvious one, you've got Bill Gates and Elon Musk. There's a couple of women in there, but unfortunately, they're members of the Walton family, the inheritance or the heirs to the Walmart empire. So again, it's this distinction between sort of entrepreneurial versus inherited wealth. Even when women are present in that top index, they are present as inheritors in the top 10. So the gender inequality within that is quite staggering. If we just take those individuals as an aside. So pretty much every, on every index or measure that we look at, there are issues. So this is really terrible. Um, so I guess the point of this course, at least is first of all to figure out how do we explore this in terms of data. And the second thing we want to ask is what can we actually kind of do about it as well as we can do. I want to just wind you back a little bit um, to think back. You're in third year, yeah, so you would have done classical social theory here. Show me Yeah, right. And when you took that course, you probably noticed, or at least I'm sure Sean told you, that one thing that preoccupied quite a lot of classical social theorists was not just the question of social development, what happens during social development. But what are the consequences of that for social well-being? We have theorists like Marx who looked at the transition from pre-capitalist to non-capitalist to capitalist societies and the consequences of that in terms of the rural, sorry, the urban industrial proletariat. 
You had the theories of Durkheim, for example, who looked at implications for social solidarity of change and divisions of labor. So what happens when social structure changes from that sort of community kin based system to one where individuals are thrust suddenly into an urbanized industrial labor force, limited social connections, and where sort of the production process in terms of material goods, but also social reproduction is, is disrupted. And some questions that these individuals spent quite a lot of time fixating on were quite basic questions that I think it's worth going back to because it sort of brings home what the point of sociology is in the first place. It's the study of collective behavior. This is the question I used to hate getting when you go home. When I was doing this degree, I'd go home and like, you know, you'd meet your granny and just say, what are you doing in college? Sociology. Okay, what the hell is that? And let's be honest, most of my friends as well. And you kind of have to come up with something and say, well, we're doing what about this, we're doing what about that, we're not really self or whatever. But one thing, okay, we're friends with all of this. It's a study of collective behavior. It's how do interacting groups give rise to collective properties, like education systems, like notions of gender, like ethnicity, and so on. And one of the most basic questions we can ask as sociologists is a very elementary kind of historical question about whether or not societies were always universally unequal. And this is a question that preoccupied Karl Marx in particular, who spent quite a lot of time looking at the structure of historical social systems. Now, there were reasons for this, of course. Again, Marx was quite preoccupied with what we might call a developmental theory uh, of industrial society, which is looking at this question of how did societies, or what happens to social order and social structure as societies transition through stages of industrialization and development and so on. And how does that work historically? Do all societies go through this process at the same time? Is it inevitable? Do all agrarian societies inevitably become industrial societies? And so on and so on. And so a lot of the blame, particularly for Marx, for Weber as well, was placed on the transition to capitalism. Capitalism as the source of all social ills and social evils in the work of Marx. For other reasons, of course, in the work of Weber. And uh, it's a question worth asking. One place we could go to look for an answer, potentially, is the work of Michael Mann, who in the 1980s wrote a very large two-volume work called The Sources of Social Power, which you don't have to read and subject it to. It's a brilliant work from Mark Tuchel. So it summarizes in one slide all the fantastic complexity of a thousand pages of years of scholarship on one, on one slide. And it's actually from volume one. So Michael Mann says, if we, if we try to make sort of naturalistic accounts of social order, and you're quite used to hearing this, you've probably heard a lot about this in other situations. People make references to human nature all the time, or inevitability. We heard it during the marriage policy referendum. Okay. Very, very significant deployments of notions of nature. What is the normal state of marriage? What is the normal state of human sexuality? We see it deployed around it, explanations for the financial crisis. We say, we have a global financial crisis, why is it? Well, humans are naturally predisposed to spend. Humans are economic creatures. We overspend, and people want to accumulate material things. We all like having stuff, so everybody took out credit. And it's our fault, it's human nature, we can't avoid this. But Michael Mann makes a very basic point. He says, for the vast knowledge of human civilization, sorry, the vast history of human civilization, we have no knowledge whatsoever of human social organization. As far back as we can go in documentary history, at least, that's an even shorter time frame. And we can go a little bit further with archaeology, but on the grand evolutionary scale of human development, we have very, very little idea about what sort of natural or basic social order was. So most of our knowledge of human hierarchies of inequalities, I mean, you'll get a sense of this when we get into the lab. If we want to look at this sort of data, we can really only go back to the 1960s. That's when countries started standardizing their national accounts and collecting income data. We can't really go back much further than that. And he makes the point, he says, about 3000 BC, we start to see the emergence of or the institutionalization of power relations. We see the emergence of sort of powers in the forms of states, patriarchies and the families. So systems of government based on usually male descent or male ascent or male lineage. And also around powerful families. So clan-based societies where social organization is based on, is based on a lot, sort of smaller scale community level social groups um, within, within her entire hierarchies. And he identifies what he calls a typical social evolutionary sequence. He says, we, if we want to periodize this, we can say that if we take the sweep of observable history, we can say that human inequality evolves in this very, very general way. We start with egalitarian societies, 
So some of the most basic dimensions of human inequality, he says, are those sort of elementary inequalities of ascriptive characteristics, like, like gender and age. Okay. How does an individual accrue power in an egalitarian society? They do it by virtue of their gender, because they happen to be male or female, or they happen to be strong or so on. And they do it on the basis of age, on seniority. These are sort of some elementary inequalities. As we move through the sweep of history, we start to see the emergence of what he calls rank societies. So as sort of human populations transition from agrarian pastoral to sedentary, we start to see what he would call resource competition. And this is sort of one of the instigators or generators of social inequality. People see control over resources. In agricultural societies, people compete for physical resources in the form of, in the form of land. Um, a good analogy for the structure of feudalism is if you ever watch Game of Thrones, um, kind of something like that. And Marx spends an awful lot of time looking at the structures of feudalism. And one of the interesting aspects of feudalism was that, first of all, it gave rise to sort of local networks of power in the sense that societies could be fractured ostensibly beneath a monarch but under the control of local lords. And there were sort of segmented or different stages or hierarchies or levels of inequality within that. So you have inequality at the level of the state, the monarchy, and then you also have local feudal lords. And then, as I'm sure Eamon Slater told you in first year, you have local landlordism, uh, if we just take the Irish case. And then finally, we have civilizations and states. What differentiates a civilization or a state? Well, one of the defining characteristics of the modern state is the monopoly of violence. The violence is the preserve of the state. The idea here being that no longer can sort of the local feudal lords go and wage war on each other as much as some people might like to do that. Can't because we have institutionalized rules around what is and isn't appropriate to do to each other's bodies. We can't kill each other at war without going to prison. Uh, ideally, but not always. And the difference here is that the monopoly of state violence means that the state monopolizes violence through the legal system, but also through the police, through the military, and that states have control, but crucially legitimation. The question here is legitimation. In what do we perceive as a legitimate use of force or violence? It's not a local devolved decision. It's a consensus process that's generated at the level of the state or legislators who write laws and decide. And so this is sort of the typical evolutionary sequence that man, that man talks about. Very, very general, highly generalized. Much more complexity in this than I can give attention to here. But just the basic idea, the idea that we can sort of track evolutionary sequences of societies from the distant non-recorded past to today. But therein, there's a certain problem. And we'll start, kind of by at the, we'll start at the back of this, because one of the questions that Marx asks at the end of Capital, um, and so after, at the end of a very, very long exposition of the capitalist mode of production, which you would have read about in your second year social theory classes, most of you in the he asks the question, which says, that, okay, here we have obviously a world of great inequality. We have financiers, merchant capital, traders, factory owners on the one hand, and we have what we might term an industrial or rural proletariat on the other hand. So if we examine society in the 19th century, at that point in which Marx is writing, he makes a broad distinction between, you've probably seen this in terms of means of production, those who possess and those who, and those who do not. Now there's sort of a conundrum, a logical conundrum here, which is if we try and wind back through history and figure out how did those people end up in those respective positions. We hit something on a brick wall. The idea of sort of inequality, industrial inequality, suggests that at some point in the distant past, something had to happen. Somebody had to acquire ownership of plant, of goods, of wealth, of military. Someone had to accrue loyalty to raise an army or to gain influence at court and so on, to accrue material wealth. How did that happen? Marx refers to this process as, well, as primitive accumulation. He says there has to be an elementary stage in human development, or human social development at least, where these sort of primary inequalities start to emerge, where individuals start to hoard or possess or hold material resources. And he calls this primitive accumulation. Now, the exposition in capital is quite vague. It's just sort of put there as a thought exercise. But what he's talking about here, principally, uh, are processes, social processes like colonialism like colonization. And if we just take the world as it is today, if there are obviously substantial global inequalities. Not all countries are equal, not all regions are equal, not all hemispheres are equal. We talk about the global north, the global south, east, west, and so on. 
we even have terms like emerging economies to describe those economies like Russia, India, and China that were previously either colonists themselves or implicated in the colonial process who are now emerging from the fetters of Western colonialism and development on their own, on their own paths. And Marx says it's during this phase what we're actually, what we need to understand to appreciate the state of modern inequality is that at some point in the distant past, those primary inequalities emerged through force, through the application of force. And he spends quite a lot of time talking about the colonial process. What happened during the sort of the Middle Ages and later during the expansion of European colonial, colonial powers towards the West? Uh, this comes from the work of um, a geographer by the name of Jason Moore. And Jason Moore uh, draws on the work of Giovanni Arrighi to talk about these things, what he calls systemic cycles of accumulation. He says, if we look back at human history, we can divide it into phases, phases of global expansion, where colonial powers, much of them in Europe, so France, Britain, Denmark, and so on, uh, countries like that, and Germany, um, of course, the UK, Britain. Uh, when those countries, Spain, Portugal, of course, started to look outwards and expand, he says there are a couple of key sort of phases in this colonial expansion that account for the acceleration of global inequality in particular times. First one he identifies is around the time of the Black Death, around 1350 to 1580. And what we start to see there then is some of the earliest sort of, let's benignly call them trade envoys for the moment. Um, in the later part, certainly in the late 16th and 17th centuries, to the Americas. We also start to see within Europe the emergence of capitalist agriculture. Now, capitalist agriculture, of course, of the emergence of capitalism has serious consequences for inequality within countries. Individuals are taken from the countryside and are moved, are moved into industrial centers for employment, and that has an influence on their earnings potential, um, their material wealth, of course, to possess land or to not possess land. But what's happening in the Americas is the institutionalization of a plantation system largely based on slavery and tribute. And this starts an international transfer process whereby the Western world, the colonial powers, extract material resources from the colonies and bring them back home. So when Marx is trying to work out this sort of, this creation myth in his head of here we are in the 19th century, why is there such a quality between individuals on the one hand, both means of production and those who don't, Scholars like Moore wind the clock back and say, well, we need to look at the long cycle of colonial exploitation on a global scale to understand this, to understand why individuals emerged in positions of power and wealth as they did. From the 1590s to the 1750s, we had the intensification of mining. We had quite extensive mining operations in Ireland in the 19th century. Uh, copper mining on the south coast from Watford all the way down to, um, all the way down to West Cork, East Kerry. Um, I believe they found gold in Monon, or something like that, or before I picked it up. That's not true. Um, and we had other things like, um, where am I going? Sorry, 1750. Yeah, so in places like uh, in West Cork, in villages like Allahy's, towns like Bonman and South Waterford, uh, we had the extraction of uh, copper ore and the export of copper ore overseas, uh, usually to Cornwall for processing. By the time we reached the mid 19th century, about two thirds of the globe is under European control. So if we just take sort of the total landmass of the world and look at where the colonial powers are distributed, those within Europe account for about two thirds of the ownership of the world's, world's landmass. At this time, then we start to see the introduction or the encroachment or the inclusion of other countries within this global network. So Russia being an obvious one, also Australia and Canada. So Russia, or some of Russia, sorry, Australia, Tasmania, interesting settlement histories because they begin their lives to Western observers, at least. Obviously, there were people there in the first nation people for centuries before. But in terms of Western interests, these countries become initially an interest of penal colonies. So we see the sentences of transportation to places like Australia and Van Diemen's land, which later became Tasmania. So through these, in this way, sort of other countries um, are colonized and incorporated into this network. And so for people like Moore, working in a Marxist framework, this is one of the primary processes by which individuals are able to accumulate wealth. Who monopolizes those trade routes? Who profits from the industries which process what's brought, what's brought back? And then finally, by the time we hit 1914, European control is at about 84, 84%. 
So decolonization. Again, this is a process within living memory. People alive today, and colonialism obviously is still, still a phenomenon. Decolonization is one of the most formative processes shaping global inequality over the 20th century, beginning in 1914 up to the present day. And there are countries still being created. In 2012, we had the creation of South Sudan. And again, itself, a legacy effect or a result of difficulties introduced during colonialism, but also during decolonization. So we have the constant creation of new territories with the return of the ostensible return of Hong Kong by Britain in the 1990s, um, which I remember because people made jokes about it at the time, but it wasn't funny, uh, which has led to a very, very different sort of development trajectory in the state of Hong Kong as a sort of a quasi subsidiary within, within China. So these are very, very important, very formative processes. So what did global wealth inequality look like over the period of decolonization? It looked something like this. And this is from the work of somebody who might have heard of Thomas Piketty, who four years ago, five or five, five years ago, um, published a book called Capital in the 21st Century. And it's a very large book. And it's not required reading on this module, but I would encourage you to look through it if you have time. The data work that went into this book is truly spectacular. It allows us to wind the clock back as far as the 1770s and look all the way up to the 2010s in terms of the structure of, of global inequality. What you're looking at here is the United States. So we can talk about sort of the definition of capital, but for the moment we can say loosely that capital and wealth are kind of synonymous. When we talk about income, you talk about something that sort of regularizes something you earn. It's usually a wage or a salary, but capital um, can be a material asset, it can be like property, but it can be something that's non-labor related from which you earn, from which you earn a return. You can have stocks in a company, some of you might have prize bonds, that's a form of state investment. Capital. You might have NTMA bonds or savings account, high yield savings account, or you might be managers of hedge funds, or you might have a pension like yourself. So, in many different ways, individuals and households can own capital in many, in many different forms. In the 1770s, this capital, if we just look at the composition of capital here, right? So, the height of this line corresponds to the percentage of capital, total national capital, in any given year. This is the United States. Unsurprisingly, in the 1770s, a substantial portion of this is people. Okay, you might notice in this graph here, this minimizes all the way down to zero in the 1880s. Well, just four. Anyone know why? Yeah, we have Lincoln and the Republican abolition of slavery in the 1880s. Okay. But doesn't mean the issues of slavery or slavery itself vanished at this point. But the cataloging of slavery or slaves as a capital component did end. We also have land, agricultural land. And Piketty makes a point in his book, he says there's a reason that when you pick up sort of classical literatures at the time and you read about them, you know, like sort of saying errors and wondering rights and that, but there's an obsession with land in those books. You know, everything at the elite level is tied to the possession or the transmission or the retention of land. And that's because land comprises a significant proportion of national capital. By the time we get to the 2010s, that proportion has fallen substantially. Now the majority of capital is composed of housing. Okay, we are all sort of petty capital owners in some way through the acquisition of property, according to Piketty. Now there's an issue here, like I said on Monday, which is that the vast majority of us, for the moment at least, are probably locked out of property ownership. But there are other things, other domestic capital. So these are things like investments, and savings and stocks and so on, and pensions in particular. So when we just look at a typical household and we talk about wealth, quite often we're talking about generally an individual's property, but also things like their pensions and their savings. So capital itself changes over the long run, and it looks very different today than it did in the 1770s. Private capital is not just land and slaves, it's housing and it's domestic capital as well. This is what it looks like in the United States at the moment. This is the share of the 0.1%. These are the wealthiest individuals within that society. And I just want you to have a look at that diagram for one second and just trace. The one that we're interested in is the US, which is the one with the triangle, okay? And just have a look at it without me talking over you for a minute and get a sense for the, for the direction. 
So basically, if we take the wealthiest individuals to the top 0.1% and look at their share of total income, what this tells us is that we start from a high down here just before the First World War, where the top 0.1%, so 10% of a percentage, the really wealthiest, the top ultra-high net worth individuals, they accounted for about 10% of total national income. That fell substantially in the UK and the US during the Great War, and then again during the Second World War. There's an important reason for this, because one of the ways that governments financed the war effort at this time was to raise taxes. So they raised the top marginal tax rate to 80, 90, and beyond percent. And we see it falls almost uninterrupted all the way down here to the 1950s, 60s and 70s, where it starts to increase again into the 1980s, all the way up to the Great Recession, just after 2008. So, uh, about a week ago, you probably, anyone heard of the Davos Conference? The G20 meeting? Yeah. yeah. There was a lot of air given to the fact that global billionaires and prime ministers showed up at Davos to talk about climate change and private jets. There was a whole lot of backlash about it, which gets quite a bit gets worse every year. One of the panelists that got on was this guy here, Michael Dell, who you might know, who made his fortune through Dell Computers, um, who currently have a monopoly on the supply of the Nuke University and every other institution in the country, I would imagine. And also recently acquired EMC, um, basically provide all the cloud computing back end for US financial bankers or financial houses and so on. And in the panel debate about taxes, uh, someone raises a question and says, what we need to start doing is taxing, is taxing the wealthy. Um, Michael Dell turns to Walker Bregman and says, name me one country in the world where a tax rate of 90% ever worked. And the guy turns back and says, well, the United States. Now, it's an interesting story in two respects. So the thing that got the airplay was that, oh, Michael Dell's an American and he doesn't know what the tax rate was. I'd imagine it's not common knowledge. And I'd imagine it's even less common knowledge that, yes, from the period 1930 all the way up to the 1970s, the top marginal tax rate in the UK was over 90%, and in the US was either at or below. That only really comes down in the 1980s. The top marginal rate, marginal rates mean the taxes you pay on earnings above a certain margin, above a certain threshold. We don't pay that rate. The majority of earners don't pay that rate. This is a tax that's levied on very, very top incomes. Okay? And as part of financing the war efforts, of course, the US or the UK raised its top marginal tax rate and issued things like war bonds to get people to invest and to provide a, a money supply for construction of munitions and the financing of expeditions and so on. But the tax rate remained in place. And it was only really abolished with the Kennedy Social Security reforms in the 60s and then later by Ronald Reagan in the 1980s and Margaret Thatcher in Great Britain later into the 1980s. But for a very long time, that top marginal tax rate remained comparatively high, certainly the highest that we've ever seen it since. And one of the key policy measures that Trump is attempting to implement at the moment is to reduce that top marginal tax rate even further. Now that he's lost congressional control, is probably the only question. But nonetheless, tax cuts for the wealthy are still on the agenda. But if we look at the overall effect that that had, the correspondence is interesting. Now, it's not just due to taxes. There's a whole lot of other stuff going on. But the interesting thing is that what the effect of that was to sort of compress the incomes of the wealthiest down to, a, to an historical low, to keep them at this low level from about the 1950s to the 1980s. It's only when we start to see the emergence of sort of pro-rich policies in the 1980s that we start to see a takeoff in the levels of inequality that have brought us back to where we are today. And interestingly, the last recorded point on this graph, it now looks a little bit worse, shows us that we're almost back to where we were just before the Great Depression. And we've exceeded it already, and we will continue to exceed it in the coming years. We don't have data this good for the Irish case, but it does look quite similar to this. Ireland and the UK look quite similar. Uh, and again, I'll be linking you resources online to do this, but we'll also be working with this data and the lab and see what's going on a little bit closer. And so finally, what are some of the culprits for this that we might want to take a closer look at? Uh, in the required reading for this week, we have an article by Lane Kennedy who talks about why the surge in income and quality. Um, it's a short article just because it's week one and then it's nine pages or so on, it's pretty easy to read. Uh, in this paper, Kenworthy goes through what he thinks based on previous research are the key sort of factors that are shaping income inequality uh, today. 
The three that I want to focus on just here are education and corporate governance and product market size. So what's changed over the last 30 years? I was just talking about the US, but a lot of this is generalized to the European, if not the Irish case. There existed in the US, as best we knew from previous income studies, a thing called the college premium. What that meant was, if we took two individuals at time X, which is, let's say, they both left school, okay, they're age 18. We have one individual who goes to university, we have one individual who goes for a vocational career path that goes straight to employment. And this figure basically says, if we take the average earnings of these two groups over, say, a five-year or ten-year period, we see a divergence. The college premium means that, on average, the earnings of those individuals with a college degree will be above those uh, without a college degree. And that effect, Ken already goes into detail in the paper, says that effect has narrowed in recent years. The graduate with a college premium has shrunk to the point where it doesn't make a substantial difference, or as substantial a difference as it once did, whether or not you graduate college or not. Now, it still does. Today, there is a college premium effect. You go to university, on average, depending on your sector, you're more likely to earn more than someone as a non-graduate. Again, on average, on average. We also have a phenomenon called a sort of mating. You might not have heard of this, but you're all intimately aware of it. And I'm sorry to break it to you. Your choice of partner is not random, as much as we'd like to believe it. Uh, we observe this effect in many, many different uh, societies. And it's an unfortunate regularity, but it's a little bit uncomfortable reading, actually, because for well, reasons we're going to tell you what they uh, Educational hypergamy is what we call the phenomenon of individuals of the same education tending to marry together, or individuals of lower education marrying to someone with higher education. Now, it sounds quite sterile to hold like that, but it's a phenomenon that we observe in income studies all the time, which is that people tend to marry within their immediate social group. Fair enough, we knew that. But the educational effect is especially strong. Individuals tend to marry people not just of their own social milieu, but also of the same level of education. That effect also on household income, it's a factor in household income, because if pairing tends to favour sort of two like higher earning couples and two lower earning couples, then that effect, that effect of amalgamation, if you like, has the effect of increasing household income inequality, because again, the idea is that partnering tends to occur with highly educated individuals two together, less educated individuals two together then we have this effect where my earnings start to, average earnings start to diverge. We have interesting things going on in corporate governance, interesting, I said, just some caution. Uh, Kevin really says that over the last 30 years, we've seen a very important and fundamental shift in the way companies and corporate entities conduct their business. More to the point, I think, the incentives around the way these companies behave. Looking just at the United States, he says, in the 1970s, or sort of, pre-1970s and the post-war era, a lot of firms were focused on increasing market share. The idea here was, if you think back to the classical sort of forest theory, the idea here was that to grow a firm, you needed to grow your product base, you needed to grow your customer base. And the idea was that if you expand the number of consumers availing of your product, assuming you're in you know, goods production, then you hire more staff, you pay more staff more, there's more skilled earning individuals in the industrial labor force. There's also more individuals consuming your products, which is good for corporate revenue. And it says it was this sort of market-focused strategy that remained pretty much dominant amongst American industries until the 1970s, when something started to change dramatically. When we look within the 1980s, the 1990s, the 2010s, sorry, we start to see a very, very different incentive structure for the goals. Now he says it doesn't matter on average whether a firm is growing its customer base or not. What matters is that they're satisfying their shareholder returns. Um, you've probably seen this if you've ever worked in retail, as I have, I spent about six years working in it before I came to college. You've probably noticed things like last week there was a story about Dunn's, uh, not Dunn's, sorry, uh, Tesco, uh, closing fresh food counters in the UK. Seems like a distant point to make from this, but it's a good illustration of the difference or the distinction between sort of growth strategies based on growing your customer base and those that based on satisfying shareholders. Tesco came through what you probably maybe heard of years ago, a significant profit warning. What that means is that ever since then, they've been looking at costs. One of the key costs, of course, in any corporate entity is, is staff. And it's a good illustration of the fact that that decision is being driven by maintaining shareholder returns, maintaining the payout of dividends and disbursement of profit, not to the employees, but to the shareholders. And sometimes the best way to do that is to cut your staff. And we see this strategy replicated time and time and time again in 
corporate entities relocating due to wage concerns and so on. What happens along with that then, and we'll talk about these individuals quite a bit as we go through the course, is that CEOs start to become crucial to the entire management process. We're sort of used to the CEO as a public personality today because of people like Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk and uh, you probably don't well, you know Tim Cook, I guess. Steve Jones and people like that. And he says that this is really sort of a new phenomenon because now with so much emphasis on maintaining shareholder value, which again is good for shareholders, not terribly good for the labour force and certainly not good for wages, CEOs start to become very, very attractive or very desirable um, as competitive managers. They're maintaining the share price, they're maintaining the returns to the company. And within this sort of cohort of senior management, we also start to see pay levels increasing exponentially throughout the 1980s and the 1990s. So the income that accrues to individuals in senior management, the extra pay that they get above and beyond sort of the median employee, is also a factor in rising top inequality, uh, which we'll be talking about um, as we go on. So, uh, yeah, that's it for today. I'll try and make this available as soon as I can. And next Monday, we're in the computer lab, CBCL1. So I'll see you then.